My name is Ruth Werner, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. And well, first of all, I was nine years old when the war started, when the Germans came into Poland. And we lived in a, a small town. It wasn't a village, but it's just a small town. It wasn't a, a big, we were about 70 kilometers out of Warsaw. And I really was very naive. I didn't even know what war means. To me, war was like people being in the main square of our town, like on market days, and fight each other. That's what I thought, you know. But I didn't know anything. My aunt, we lived in one side of the marketplace and my aunt lived on the other side. And the only worry I had is I won't be able to go to my aunt and visit my cousins. But, um, but the, the, the Friday that the Germans came in to us, my mother made it like it's a big adventure. And she said, we're going to go to my aunt's house and we'll sleep over there. And to me, that was the highlight of my week. So we went there. And she had seven children and um, four boys. They, they lived in a small apartment, like two rooms and a kitchen. So, uh, but on the courtyard, there was like a shack. So four boys slept there. They were poor people. And in the bedroom, my uncle slept with the other three children. So Friday night, you know, it's, it's customary for Jewish people to light candles. So she lit the candles, and me and my mother slept in the, in the kitchen. It was like a bench. She opened up the bench. There was a straw mattress, and you slept there. It, I would say it's like comparable now like to a food futon, but it wasn't as nice as a futon. So me and my mother lay there, and, and the, the Germans came into the building. They shared it. My aunt lived in the downstairs apartment. And um, she stood in the doorway protecting the bedroom so they, nobody would know that there are people there. And a German opened the door and asked her in, in German, then is a Juden, that means are you Jews? And she said, because Jewish language in German is very similar, so she answered, yes, we are, we are Jews. And he pointed a gun at her and me and my mother. and. Um, I was so scared, I, I, I was laying so close to my mother, I, I think I was wanted to crawl into her skin, you know, just to be near her. And as young as I was, I knew we were going to die, but it really, I wasn't that scared because I was near my mother. And he would have shot us on the spot. And it wasn't an order from a um, higher officer, he just did it because he, he could. But in the meantime, you know, we heard a co the call from a captain or a lieutenant, I don't know, and he called him by his name, Franz, or Heinz, whatever, and he called him out and the, he turned around and left the, the house and we, we were alive. Why it happened that we're still alive? Maybe God wanted us to live longer, I don't know. But that was my first encounter with the Germans. Now. We got up at Saturday morning and it was customary for the people to go to the synagogue to pray. And that very religious man walked to the synagogue and the Germans called out to him, Halt, Halt, that means stop, stop, but he didn't understand it. So he was walking, so he shouted. That was our first casualty. And, from, and then they, they, they just did a few things like this in town and they disappeared and we never knew when they'll come back. When they came back, they did a lot of mayhem. They would go into rooms, and if they saw a baby in a crib, they would turn over the crib with the baby in it. I mean, atrocities, you know. Finally, but after like two months like this, they came one day, they took us all out, all the Jews, we were like maybe 400 families, Jewish families, the rest were Polish, Pol Polacks, and they took us out in the marketplace, and you know, and what they did is, if, the, if the, some men had beards, the religious men, what they did, if they would cut out a piece of the beard right in the middle, so you know, just to make him look like a caricature. And we were standing there, 
and they gave us one hour to get home, take whatever we could carry and be out of the, of the, of the city, not just the house, but of the town. Now whoever got money would hire a horse and buggy to take us. So we, my, my mother had money because my father was in America. It's a different story. And he sent us money, so she had some money. And we hired a, a horse and buggy and we left. And my aunt, my uncle, and my mother, myself, and my, my aunts, she had four older sons, one, I guess, from like 27 or 28 down to uh, 7. And so the children, we all sat in the wagon, whatever clothing we took with us, and they told us where to go. They told us that where to go where the, the, the Russian soldiers were in Bialystok, and that's where we went. We were there, I don't know how long, maybe a month or something, we didn't have apartments or anything. We were sleeping in the clubhouses. And the, the, somehow, I don't know where we got the food, but we were fed, you know. And from there, the Russians came and they offered us a passport to go to Russia. So we went, because to stay in Poland, you know, they made, it was called an oblava, you know, like a gathering. If you were on the street and the Germans were, and they caught you, they send you away something. They send you to a concentration camp. I mean, people disappeared every day. So we were, we came to Russia and they, we came to Belarusia. We stayed there maybe 10 months or something like that. And then the, um, you know, Hitler made a pact with Stalin not to invade Russia. But after two months, you know, he invaded Russia. He broke the pact. So when that happened, we were on the run like gypsies from one city to the other. Wherever the Germans were, we went run further, you know. And being I was, I was really not an athletic child. So I was always in, in the back of everybody, you know, struggling. My mother had to wait for me to, to go with them because we couldn't afford to, to get lost from the, separate from the other people because we wouldn't have known where to be. So that was, in, we were seven years in Russia. And then, we, we, you know, they gave us train, but open trains. It wasn't, they, they what do they call those trains? Not, not passenger trains, with open roof. And we were there traveling. And I, I remember, you know, one night it was raining and I was sitting down and my mother was leaning over me to protect me from the rain. I was an only child and that's all she had. And we traveled and we came to a crossroads where there were a, a big, big stations and, and the rails went all over Russia. So we, we traveled like that and then we wound up in the Ural Mountains. In 1942, we came to the Ural Mountains. I was 12 years old then. And it was very cold there very cold. There the, the summer lasts about two, three or four months, not more. I mean, the, the, the snow melts in, in May and then it starts snowing in September. And they can't grow any fruit or anything because it's not enough summer. It's only some vegetables and uh, some grain. And we were there like from 42 to 44, two years. And they were the most horrible two years of my life because I grew, I was already like 14, 12, 14 years old and I needed food and we didn't have it. And it was very hard. And we worked in a kolkhoz. That's like a kibbutz in Israel, a communal living in America or something like that. Everybody worked the fields together. So being, you know, my mother worked from home and they sent me away to cut the grain and I, I remember that the first day I didn't cut enough with a uh, skit, skit it's called mm. S-C-Y-T-H-E, skit and they didn't give me the bread they just gave me a little bit of soup to eat 
and I had to hide myself in the in the straw uh, piles to to sleep the night. And I had a feeling that I should go home. It was quite a few kilometers to walk. So on the way, I stopped in the in the woods and I picked some blueberries. And when I came on the outskirts of, of our village, I met a uh, a boy that went to school with me. And he told me that my mother had died. And I had my aunt living in the same village, but my mother was my whole life. And I was just ready to, to sleep in the, in, the, in the fields. I was afraid to go home. So I went home and that day they had like a big house in the front where the owners lived. In the back they had like a little house, like a two room house. And that's where me and my mother lived. In this two room, we had like a pallet to sleep and then we had an oven like to bake bread or to cook on it. I mean, you couldn't turn around. More than two people couldn't be there. So I was walking around and crying under the window and my mother heard me and she called my name. And I, the first thing out of my mouth is, are you alive? You're not dead? And she said, no, I'm not dead. I'm alive. So I came in and she was, she was so uh, uh, how do you say you 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 grow big you know from sickness like my ankles swollen swollen she was so swollen that she was laying on the pallet on her back you couldn't see her face that's how her, her stomach was swollen because she was from hunger so that time I took. Um, I went to, with my berries, I went to the people that lived there, you know, they were nice. And I gave them the berries and they gave me some milk for my mother. And because we didn't have any doctors, we didn't have any medicine, but she recuperated. And I'm going to go back, you know, like I, I mentioned that we were traveling on trains from place to place. So the, the, the Germans were, were, were striving us with, you know, and everybody came out of the wagons and, and a lot of people were running into a forest. But me with my mother, we, we hid under the wagon near the wheels and a, a bullet flew through us, you know, almost touched us, but didn't. A lot of people got killed, the ones that were running to the wood because they were, they could be seen because it was, they had to run through an open field. So. You know, I don't know, in, in the seven years I was there, we, we went through a lot, of, a lot of hell, a lot of hell. We never thought that we'll come back to Europe again and to America. We never even dreamt about coming to America. Okay, when I came to America, I was like three weeks shy of 18. And I was determined to learn English because when I came to America, I didn't know a word of English. My, my aunt, my father's sister, she taught me to say I don't understand English because I was young, tall, and uh, if in New York you usually ask for directions and everybody would ask me where and I didn't, I couldn't, so I would say I don't understand English. And I went every place with a dictionary. I read books with a dictionary. I went to the movies with a dictionary. And then I went to night school. I mean, we really try to assimilate ourselves into American life. And we lived in, in, in Newark, we came to Newark, New Jersey, a cousin of my mother lived there, we lived there. And then in 1948, in 1949 we moved to New York and we lived in New York. And I, uh, I came, um, I, uh, let's, okay. I had a date with a, with a um, a guy, a girlfriend's brother, to go out on a Saturday night. And I wasn't too excited about him, he was a little shorter than me, you know, older. But so after the movie that time, you know, it's we, we went out for coffee or something, but there were dances in New York that the people that came from Europe, the young people, they used to make uh, dances Saturday night. So I said, let's go there. We went there and I met the most gorgeous guy in the world. And he was dancing with a beautiful girl and I envied them so much, I, I kept looking at them the whole night. Turned out she had a boyfriend, but then he was just dancing with her. Then Monday, Monday night I went to night school, to high school night school. 
And who do I see there? That gorgeous guy. <laughs> so I came in and to tell you the truth, he thought I was an American girl because the European girls that came to America, they were wearing dressed heels and nylon stockings and beautiful. I was dressed in penny loafers with socks, you know, so he thought I was an American. Of course, when I opened my mouth, he saw that I wasn't. So the teacher said, if I find a seat, I can be in the class. So my future husband made me, gave me a seat next to him. And he took me home that night and we dated for two years. For one year, we got engaged. And for the second year we got married and we were almost married 50 years when he died in 2001. And we had three children. It was Barbara was the oldest, Judy was the middle one, and Kenny was the baby. And, uh, and we have, now I have seven grandchildren and I have two great grandchildren. And I'm an old lady now. I'm still here. That's all, yeah, that's about enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I dated him for two years, mm -hmm. but I was 20. But when uh, I had to get engaged by 21, so I got engaged by 21, because otherwise I would have been an old maid <laughs> in my mind. Mm -hmm. And at 22, I was married. The 25th of February was our anniversary. Mm. Yeah. You said that the first night you saw him? Yeah. You said I'm going to marry him? I told this to my mother, not to him. Yeah. <laughs> he was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You can see it on the wedding picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Was a romance. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, he was tall. And I dated a lot of guys, but they were short. So I had to wear flats. Mm -hmm. And with him, I could buy shoes with a heel. That time, I could wear heels, you know. Mm -hmm. And who cared what he did? My mother asked me what he's doing for a living. I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, when you're young, you know, you don't care if you make a living or not. Mm -hmm. You'll find out later. <laughs> and when Eric, Barbara was 11 months old, we came on to run it for the chicken farm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, take care of it. <laughs> <laughs>